Hello, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, MIT Sloan Alumni Online brings you the latest breaking news, cutting edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty and alumni. Today we are pleased to have Doug Reddy joining us to discuss the top team's job in building game-changing organizations. Doug is a senior lecturer in organizational effectiveness here at Sloan and is the founder and CEO of ICEDR, the International Consortium for Executive Development Research. Professor Reddy is considered one of the world's leading authorities on strategic talent management and executive development. In 2017, he was named to the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame, a global ranking of the most influential management thinkers in the world. Professor Reddy is the author of several acclaimed MIT Sloan Management Review articles, including his most recent, How to Become a Game-Changing Leader. His writings have also appeared in the Financial Times, Business Strategy Review, and the Wall Street Journal, among others. Professor Reddy has also taught at London Business School and advises CEOs and top teams around the world on large-scale, enterprise-wide change efforts. Professor Reddy, it's great to have you with us today. I'll now turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much uh, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, and welcome, everybody, from around the world. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here. It's my honor to be here uh, with you today. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm just going to dive right into things, and I'm hoping that we can have a nice, robust Q&A session and a discussion afterwards. So, uh, so let's get started. Um, you know, we're, we're really talking about this idea of the top team's job in, in building game-changing organizations. Uh, so uh, as you all know, we get, we get big things done in our organizations through teams, not necessarily through only the charismatic leader. So much emphasis is placed on, you know, looking at, uh, at the charismatic CEO, but research that I've done on enterprise leadership teams really uh, drives home the point that increasingly the value and the contribution of teams is absolutely critical. So let's dive into that and get a better understanding of what the skill sets and the mindsets are of a game-changing organization. Um, but before we do that, I want us to say, well, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about the idea of a game-changing organization? Pretty simple, really. I mean, we're talking about an organization that stands out from from the pack, from the rest of uh, of those in your in your peer group. Uh, it's it's an organization that lets people be themselves, raise their hand, have a point of view, uh, you know, to be able to share, you know, what's uh, what they think are valuable contributions. It also is a kind of organization that is not afraid to swim across the stream uh, and, and, to, and try to experiment and try new things. Uh, yet, in, uh, But more so, it's also an organization that creates differentiated value from its competitor peer group as well. So it's not just about being wildly innovative, but also an organization that knows how to get things done and has a strong sense of customer obsession. So, uh, so let's, let's take a look. You know, you know some of the obvious companies that are always listed as game changers. Uber, uh, world's largest taxi company, doesn't own any, any vehicles. Facebook, uh, as, as we've, you know, all seen in the press, uh, increasingly you see, uh, Amazon and Alibaba, uh, you know, these are, these are game-changing companies, Airbnb, world's largest accommodation provider, but they own no uh, real estate, actually. And then Netflix, the world's largest video store, but has no store. And so these are, these are the ones that we see all the time in the press, but I'd like to also submit that many, many different kinds of organizations can be game-changers not just the go-go uh, tech-based uh, companies. So I want to bring all of us into this mix. So there are companies like uh, Continental, who was the first hire company in the world uh, and is now a, a, uh, an outstanding tier one supplier to the global automotive industry. RBC, um, a, an organization that has started off in Canada and is now the 15th largest financial services firm in the world. Uh, and, you know, so there's many different organizations that, that really can make a difference. So 
the big question is, what about your company? What's, what's it going to take for your company to be a game-changing leader? And then what's the role of the top management teams in making that happen? So that's what we're going to be focusing our attention on uh, over these next 30, 40 minutes or so. So the big question is, where do we start? How do we understand uh, what some of the key uh, skills are of, of the organization? But I'd also like to uh, have us pay attention to what the mindsets are of, uh, of game-changing leaders. So we'll be taking a look both at the skill sets and the mindsets. And I'll, uh, I'll talk with you a little bit more about the mindset uh, uh, element uh, in just a few moments. So, you know, the, uh, in the research I've done, I've, I've studied uh, management teams all around the world, enterprise leadership teams, uh, what is it that they do? Uh, and this is not about individual competencies as much as it is about the things that leadership teams do to produce uh, significant outcomes. And that's what we're paying attention to now. So let's take a look. What is it, uh, after talking with uh, hundreds of, of these folks, um, what they do uh, first and foremost is they create clarity. At a minimum, they pursue clarity. So uh, in a uh, you know, breakneck, uh, fast-paced world, sometimes it's tough to achieve perfect clarity, but the top team's job is to do whatever they can to provide as much clarity as possible. Clarity of what? Clarity of purpose, clarity of vision, clarity of values, clarity of the strategy, uh, clarity of the leader behaviors that are going to be important. So that's the first thing that, uh, that they'll do. The next is that they understand how critically important it is to unleash the energy of the organization. So this is not about just finding the needle in the haystack, the one or two leaders. It's about trying to make sure that we're unleashing uh, the, uh, the energy all throughout the company. And that's, uh, that's, that's where this notion of listening to diverse voices, creating an inclusive environment comes in. It's very important. The third they do is they build trust. They, they make sure that what they're doing is uh, the messages that they're creating are reinforced through actual uh, initiatives, through rewards, uh, and through consequences as well. So, so they build trust inside the organization to create a certain level of emotional safety, so to speak, so people feel free for that, that fellow that I showed you of raising his hand on that, on that second slide. Uh, the next thing they do is they focus on winning. They focus on making sure that they have the discipline that's critical for them to execute, for them to build the capabilities that they need to in order to actually implement their broad-based visions. And finally, the fifth thing that they do uh, really well is that they shape tomorrow. They're never satisfied with, uh, with the status quo and what's going on today. They're constantly questioning constantly uh, opening up, asking people's inputs uh, so that they're kind of an institutionalized paranoia that's baked into the, into the organization. So let's take a look at each one of these things very quickly, uh, and, and then we can open it up perhaps uh, for, for some questions. Uh, okay, so, so uh, creating clarity. Um, you know, this is, this is what I like to call a, the cluttered mind of a top management team. Uh, it's what I call a starburst chart organization. Uh, you know, if you think there's probably 25, 30 things here, the big question is what happens if, if you're a part of a top management team and articulate each one of these things as the number one priority for your company? Well, the easy answer is nothing happens, and uh, in some days I wish that's all that happened, but but, you know, what does happen is chaos starts to reign, confusion, initiative champions start to bubble up in the organization, and people, people get lost. And so they duck their heads and they wait for things to settle down, and, of course, they never will. And so, so we've got to provide some level of focus. And if you're thinking that, oh, yeah, this is, this is not me, I guarantee you if I were to go into your organization and and look at your website in one hour. I could probably fill in these starburst charts with with the things that uh, that you might call buzzwords about different initiatives that are going on. It's not an indictment of any one company. It's just to say that that large complex companies that have lots of things on their plate, uh, it they, they really requires that they create a uh, a sense of focus and clarity. So what is it that the great uh, teams do? Well, the first thing they do from from the research that, that I've done is they place purpose at the hardwood of their company's business model. Uh, there's a lot 
lot of talk these days. In fact, Davos is going on right now as we speak, and I guarantee you there's a panel of CEOs that are talking about the purpose-driven enterprise. It's a very important issue now. Uh, it is how do you find the North Star, why we exist as an organization. This is particularly important to the millennial generation. So for those of you who are uh, who are who rely heavily upon getting that kind of next-gen talent into your companies, uh, making sure that there's a clarity of purpose is key. But that's not enough uh, in order to build a game-changing organization. So the great teams that do this, yes, they do place purpose at the hardwood, but they combine that with a very powerful sense of what I like to call edge, a kind of a, a strong performance orientation both long-term with their vision, but also short-term with the clarity of their strategic and operational priorities. So, um, so that there is there is that sense of purpose, but with the element of, of performance. But what I also found is even that's not enough. And there's a third element here that is critical, which is principles, uh, both externally with our, uh, within our ecosystem outside, our brand promise, our partners, our customers, our shareholders, uh, you know, so, but uh, just as, and perhaps more importantly, inside with their core values and guiding principles. And so, so when we think about the role of top management teams in creating clarity, it's focusing on how we build organizations that are purpose-driven, performance-focused, and principles-led simultaneously. And that's the hard part, you know, and, and one of the things I hope we get into during the Q&A is why is this so hard to do simultaneously, purpose-driven, performance-focused, and principles-led? Uh, so, uh, you know, a quick answer to some of these things is that we've got to think about, you know, the world around us. Um, you know, we're talking about constant revitalization, and yet people are so stressed out they want some level of normalization in their lives. And so that's a tension that we have. Uh, you are, are I'm undoubtedly in a company that is in the process of either globalizing uh, or developing a, a, at a minimum a multi-regional strategy, and yet at the same time we're trying to sort out how to simplify doing business with our customer base. Uh, that's another tension. Uh, a, a third is that we're trying to constantly innovate, but in, in many uh, industries, particularly financial services these days, we're under a crushing uh, level of, of, of regulations, most primarily because of, of the 2017, 2008 uh, financial crisis. Um, there's, there's another uh, thing that we're trying to optimize value for our customers. At the same time, we're trying to rationalize our cost base. Finally, uh, virtually every company I know is in some way digitizing their business model while at the same time people are screaming uh, uh, for some sense of, of humanity uh, in the organization that, you know, do I matter? Uh, is, is my voice heard? And that sort of thing. So we see, we see some of these uh, issues, which, which means that uh, this idea of, of creating clarity has a lot to do with the efficacy of the, of the story that is told by our top management team. How do we link these things together? Our purpose, why we exist, our performance and our vision, what are the big things we hope to achieve over the next five years or so, and our principles and core values, what is it that we believe in, uh, what are the things that, uh, that we hold dear in terms of how we're going to work, not only with our customers and our communities, but with each other. So that's, uh, that's the first that we want to take a look at. That, this next one is about unleashing energy. Um, and I know that's, I, I love this little uh, cartoon about, uh, you know, this, this ant up on the hill who's, uh, who's just questioning him or herself, just saying, you know, how the heck do I tell them I don't have a clue where we're going? Well, you know, this is, uh, this is the perfect uh, model of yesterday's leadership, the expectation that the charismatic one leader is going to lead the charge. Uh, it's super clear we don't need leaders like this anymore in next-gen organizations. What's also clear, though, that I'd like to just point out to you is we don't need followers like this anymore either. So uh, there has to be a much better kind of economy that goes back and forth between a leader asking for help, seeking input, 
and and our uh, our associates and employees, you know, standing up, raising their hand, providing uh, that. How do we create the climate that's uh, that's going to be critical? So we want to make sure that uh, that we're we're doing that. And and let me just give you a little bit. And I promise you, this is the only two by two I'll give you. Uh, but you know, in in the first, you know, if, if when we take a look at the level and quality of dialogue against the level of expectations and accountability for results. You know, if we're in that low, low uh, quadrant, you know, there's, there's no discussion, no talk about, you know, so, some uh, disruptor who might be uh, really causing us, wreaking havoc with us, and, and no expectations uh, for change. That's what I call a bad marriage. We don't talk about it and we don't care. And that's a really bad uh, quadrant to be in. The next is when there's all kinds of expectations of, you know, and accountability, but we don't have any dialogue around what we can do to fix it. That's when we see this, uh, this idea of there being a blame game culture. And you see this evident in silo driven enterprises. This is a very big deal when we're, when we're living in organizations that are filled with silos. The third, is is what um, you know. To, and for those around the world, uh, apologies in advance. This will hopefully be the only U.S. reference I'll make to. You. In fact, it's even more micro than that. It's a Texan reference, and that you know we've all heard the the notion uh, of of the, the the wannabe cowboy of uh, big hat no cattle. That's you know somebody who talks the big game but doesn't have any resources. So when when our team talks about being the innovative enterprise. Uh, you know, and, and yet we don't provide any resources, no dialogue around, you know, lots, no, no accountability to actually make something happen. Uh, just too much talk, no action. Finally, what we want to do is we want to create a, a robust level of dialogue and discussion, lots of questioning, lots of expectations, both for collective leadership, but also for individual accountability. So when we're talking about uh, unleashing energy, we want to talk about this idea of how do we build inclusive environments uh, so that people have that sense of emotional safety and the idea that, that they belong. They belong in this meeting. They belong in this room. They belong in this company. And so that's what we're looking for here. Understanding that diverse voices are much more naturally engaged because they feel much uh, safer, frankly, to be able to raise their hand, express a point of view. Uh, and, and as our top management teams need to understand that it is not like this big ant at the top of that hill, but they need to ask for help and they need to be explicit about the kind of help that they want, but at the same time, created that climate of accountability. And so what we're together, we have this sense of uh, both collective leadership, um, but at the same time, lots of individual accountability for doing your job. So, so that's one way we're going to really unleash the energy uh, inside the organization. Uh, the third, and I think this is a really critical uh, element, and in a sense, it's a byproduct of the first two. Uh, if we if we um, tell powerful stories, if we link together our purpose and uh, and our our performance expectations, and be clear about our principles, we do it in a way that's inclusive, that invites lots of voices. Uh, what we're going to do, and we do it in an authentic way, where we actually really want uh, the input that uh, we're asking people to provide, then we're going to build trust, and and we're going to build that trust and solidify that trust by being able to actually uh, deliver on things and show and show that through actual actions that we've uh, participated in. I, I just think again, this is just kind of a fun way to laugh at ourselves for so many uh, organizations that, that stop at the slogan stage. You know, they'll say that, you know, we want to we want to be, the, uh, be viewed as the company with a heart, but we're, you know, uh, but what I'm going to tell you offline is that uh, uh, if you mess up, I'm going to chew you up and smear you into the carpet. That's not quite building a sense of trust that I'm talking about here. So we want to, you know, the, what we need to do is, uh, is think about what kind of, of climate are we creating? And so that's why I like to say we, we need to talk about the C word uh, here. And, and that is uh, culture. It's, it's all about how we build a, an authentic, powerful culture. Normally, the, uh, the traditional kind of definition of culture is 
the way we behave around here. And, and that's great, and, and I think that gets us part of the way there, and that's usually an answer if I'm in a class uh, that, uh, that, that I'll get from participants. Uh, you know, what is uh, how we do things around here? But I'd like to challenge you a little bit to say, well, it's, you know, there are different elements that we need to think of, not just about the way we behave, but that, that we have, need to bring in our shared beliefs. Uh, we need to bring in the articulated values that we have of what we hold dear. Then we have to talk about our, the normative behaviors. In other words, the ones that are accepted uh, walking around the hallways in, in the organization. Uh, and then to see to what extent are there rewards and consequences. So it's that kind of balance of saying, do our shared beliefs, our articulated values line up with the normative behaviors that we see walking around the hallways? And if they don't, are there uh, consequences? And if they do, are there sufficient rewards? Uh, so, so we need to balance these things out. Uh, so as we think about culture, I would like to think about it as the the authenticity of our culture. So the way we behave around here, supported by rewards and consequences that are transparent and fairly distributed. So, um, so as we as we think about this a little bit more broadly, uh, and recognizing that we're MIT, and so for MIT, for the scientists in the room, if you think more in terms of formulas, here it is: uh, OC equals SB plus AB divided by ND. So organizational culture is our shared beliefs plus our articulated values divided by the normative behaviors that we see. Does that yield an approximate, maybe not perfect, but a, an approximate basket of rewards and consequences? So I thought it'd be fun for you for you know MIT that this is how a lot of us think. Uh, so that, you know, the authentic culture that we're talking about uh, can be both what, 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 what I like to call blue and grease. And uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, you know, if we've got an authentic culture, it can provide the glue that binds us together. Um, so we get past the tough times. Uh, we all saw that in the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Those companies that, uh, that got through those tough times uh, usually had an authentic culture, not just a strong one, but one that was authentic, which meant that if, uh, if, if there were problems that had to be sorted out, people uh, provided the input and they, they worked through these things. Uh, it also can be the grease, though, that can help enable and facilitate uh, execution, implementation, and provide some fresh thinking. But, you know, there's another element to glue and grease that we need to think about, an unhealthy, inauthentic culture can also be glue and grease, the glue that keeps us stuck in the past so that uh, we become uh, really reluctant to change when we need to change, or the grease that causes us to slip and fall. You know, times when, uh, when, it just, when we need focus, when we need that North Star, uh, if we have an inauthentic culture, we're going to lose trust inside of the organization. So, so we need to begin to think about the idea that trust is actually built by aligning the promises that we make, particularly through those first two segments, uh, creating clarity and unleashing the energy in the organization with the promises kept. So promises made being aligned with promises kept. And the promises kept is all about making sure that there are metrics, milestones, rewards, and yes, consequences uh, for uh, the, the, the extent to which that there is either good or bad behavior that's lined up. So, so that's the first three. Now let's get into what we all are hoping to do with our companies, which is winning and creating as much of a competitive advantage uh, as we possibly can. I've, I've given up on the term sustained competitive advantage. Uh, you know, I think that that what we need to do. It makes us think that if we get a perfect strategy that somehow we're going to, you know, be okay for the next 20 years. I mean, I, I just need to dispel us from that, uh, especially in this world. What we need to focus on is do we have the customer obsession? Do we have the right capabilities, the right talent to be able to make sure that we're winning uh, in the short term? And we'll get to this notion of how we try to shape the future uh, in, in, in a few moments. But but we need to think about this idea of capability building. You know, what are the skills, what are the processes that we need to create that's going to create some level of differentiation for us 
that for however long we can hold on to it, that will provide a competitive advantage. You know, and, and one of the things that I, I find that why this is so difficult is uh, McKinsey did a study a couple of years ago where they talked to companies about, you know, to the extent to which they agree that new capability building is, is critical uh, to achieving competitive advantage. And, you know, to virtually no one's surprise, including my own, more than two thirds of the company said this is absolutely critical. What was a surprise uh, to me in particular was that less than one third of those companies actually said they were doing it. So uh, I, I found that a stunning data point that, that most of us understand we need to build new capabilities, yet uh, you know, a very small percentage of companies actually uh, roll up their sleeves and get to work on building those capabilities. And so why is this the case? What's going on here uh, that we need to think about? Well, you know, when, whenever I've done these capability maps, uh, I find that the upper level executives are always much more in love with the current strategy than those down closer to the customer or client interface. And why? The answer is simple. They're the ones that created that strategy. So they, they're much more inclined to think it's brilliant. So we need to be a little bit careful about, about that. Uh, you know, often, you know, we just talked about culture, and this is a very big deal. Culture can, can be that glue that keeps us stuck and make it very hard for us to, you know, to speak out and, and be that person that's going to raise their hand and say, this is nuts. You know, we need to think uh, differently about uh, delighting our customers. The third is that talk is, is way too cheap. If you remember this big cat, no cattle, uh, it's very easy to say we're going to be the innovation leader um, and the customer service leader. But, you know, saying it doesn't make it so. We need to build the capabilities uh, to make it happen. And, and finally, routine is way too comfortable for us. Uh, for all the talk about, the, you know, we love change and we need to thrive on it. We're, we're, our mental maps are hardwired to resist change. So we need to understand that and we need to unlearn a lot of the things that, uh, that we've uh, come to, to treasure and value about our business models to be able to say that uh, we're going to take a fresh look at things. And so, so these are just some of the reasons uh, why some of the, uh, the capability building process is difficult. So winning today, we need to have the discipline uh, to be able to innovate and to execute. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we are, you know, committing to, as Jeff Bezos says at Amazon, constant, continual customer obsession, shareholder happiness, and employee excitement. I mean, these are the things that are going to build, you know, and, and we as top team members have a lot to do with being able to foster that, that uh, climate inside. And, and one of the ways is by making sure that we that we bust those silos uh, and, and don't get into blame game climate and culture and engage in cross-border know-how. So, so let's talk about this last piece, uh, which is all about shaping tomorrow. Um, so you know, what, a lot of the times we say, well, can, can we actually shape tomorrow? I mean, are we, are we in a position to do that? Are our top teams able to actually go about shaping what tomorrow is going to look like inside of our companies? Well. You know, that's, uh, that's one of the questions we need to consider. Uh, and, and, and if we can, how are we going to find the people that are going to enable us to do that? So these are the, uh, the questions we need to ask around this. And I've spent, you know, a good amount of time, as Kathy said, you know, uh, you know researching and writing and focusing on, on how you build next generation talent strategies inside of, of organizations. And, uh, so the question that I have about this then is, is this a capability building problem around finding the talent that we're going to need to shape tomorrow, or is it a culture challenge? Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer up the idea that it could be a little bit of both. We need to learn how to build the capabilities in both uh, the talent that we're going to bring into the organization, uh, and uh, in the talent that we already have, how we're going to help them to develop the skills and perspective that they need uh, to be able to stay out in front. Um, but it can also be a culture change challenge uh, that, uh, that keeps us stuck in our current business model, lets the door open for disruptors to be able to come in and 
and surprise us. So that's, that's what led to uh, a series of Sloan articles that I wrote about the role of top management teams, enterprise leadership teams, and as Kathy brought up, the most recent one uh, that I did actually with Alan Mulally, who was the former CEO of Ford and Boeing Commercial Airlines. Uh, and uh, I'll bring Alan's views in, in a moment here. So, uh, so, so we know this. We know that what we're trying to do is to build organizations that have these five skill sets resident in the top management teams. Our teams need to create a sense of clarity. They need to unleash energy. They need to build trust. They need to build the capabilities together with the organization to be able to win today. And they need to have this robust sense of constant questioning to be able to help shape tomorrow. But the issue is, you know, why when we know that these are some of the things that our top leadership teams need to be able to, to build in the organization, why do so many uh, enterprise leaders struggle and often actually derail as a part of their uh, enterprise leadership teams. Uh, you know, why did that, you know, so, so it, to me, it, it becomes the issue of saying, this is really a paradox. Uh, if you want to build game-changing organizations, if you want to be a game-changing leader, and if you want to build a, a game-changing leadership team, it's simply not enough to only focus on those five things that I just went over with you. So we need to think about that idea of mindsets marrying up with the skill sets. And so, so they, these things work in conjunction with one another. Those five elements are absolutely key, but also it's the presentation of the meal. It's the mindset that we're going to bring to the role. So the enterprise leadership team's role uh, is to in, in, enable others to think about building the perspective, a sense of context uh, about you know, what, uh, what our customers need, what our shareholders are expecting, but also in doing that, uh, understand that there are going to be embedded tensions. As we're trying to, to build uh, you know, uh, organizations that are future focused, if we're trying to link together purpose, performance, and principles, there are inherent conflicts that are going to come into play by doing that. And, uh, you know, most often our performance expectations with our core principles, uh, sometimes these things seem to be in conflict. And so we need to be able to reconcile those tensions. And here's where we get into this idea of, you know, our, the, the mindset component of this is really about appreciating dualities. It's, and, and what I mean by dualities is that there are what, what appear to be polar opposites uh, in, in the mindset of your enterprise leadership teams. We have to have a sense of urgency about uh, bringing about large-scale change. At the same time, we have to have patience uh, to, in order to, uh, to, to know that deep change takes time. We've got to build a sense of collective leadership, but with an individual accountability. We've got to be a developmental coach uh, to help our people, but we also have to focus on relentless performance. We've got to be a perpetual student asking questions and learning, and yet at the same time be an inspirational teacher. And we've got to be the humble steward, but then also make sure that we're a bold change agent. Now with that, uh, with the, this article that, um, it's available actually in the in the Sloan Management Review in the in the winter session. Uh, was was it talked about Alan's views of this? You know, when he talked about joining Ford, he talked about the fact that they were just about ready to go out of business, uh, and yet he had to be patient by asking people to raise their hand to to bring about ideas for change. When he talked about this collective and individual leadership thing, you know, he, t he talked about that everybody had to understand that if they were going to win, they were going to win together. And that was his big mantra for this. This idea of developmental coach and relentless performance driver, winning together was everything, but uh, that, that didn't get people off the hook for delivering on the performance objectives. Student and teacher was all about saying, Alan said, I'm going to start every meeting talking about purpose, performance, and principles, yet at the same time, we're going to make sure uh, that, that we're going to uh, make sure that we get things done as well. And bold uh, uh, servant and change catalyst, it's absolutely clear that 
that we need to provide the, the sense of, of uh, support for our people and, be, and that we're stewards. Our tap management teams are stewards of the organization. And by being stewards, that means that you've got to have the courage and take the risk to be able to bring about big change uh, inside of our company. So I don't want us to say that these are only the purview of folks like the Alan Mulallis of the world, although he's clearly a great charismatic leader. Uh, I want to bring this to the level of, of everyday you know, leadership teams. Uh, these are some of the very real people. These are their real pictures of people who, who really helped uh, to inform some of the research that I did. And they talk about these things, like I'm a bridge builder, I'm a puzzle crafter. Uh, you know, I, I needed to bring a sense of perspective and context to the table uh, to be able to lead my team more effectively. I needed to have the proper mindset in the organization. So it really is this idea of merging together skill sets and mindsets if we hope to build organizations that are going to be game changers, which I say are those that are purpose-driven, performance-focused, and principles-led simultaneously. Can't just do it alone with just the skill sets. We need to bring that mindset understand the importance of managing those dualities at the same time. And if we could do that, I think that we can go a long way toward building uh, those game-changing organizations. So with that, I'd just like to thank you. I'd like to uh, turn it over to back to Kathy. Uh, Kathy, and hopefully there are some questions that we might have. And uh, I just uh, open the rest up for a sense of dialogue. Terrific. Thank you so much, Doug. As a reminder to our participants, please type in your questions in the Q&A box on the right side of the screen. Take a moment to make sure that you've selected all panelists before submitting your question. While you're doing that, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about upcoming MIT Sloan Alumni Online events. Uh, next, on February 15th, we have Bryn Penny Burkhart, who will be joining us for the first in a three-part series um, on careers, navigating your career at any age and stage, followed by a session on leveraging LinkedIn and one on compensation conversations. You can register on the MIT Sloan Alumni Online website where, you're, where you will also find links to previously recorded sessions. Or stay tuned for future communications from our team with details about joining upcoming sessions. I also want to quickly tell you about a few events coming up around the country. We have MIT Better World campaign events happening this spring, one in Seattle and another in Miami. And we have the Future of Work Digital Economy Conference in April in New York City. You can find information about these events using the link on your screen or mitsloan.mit.edu slash alumni. So now let's move on to questions. We'd like to start today's Q&A with some spotlight questions that were submitted during registration. Our first question comes from Ellen Quackenbush, SM85. Ellen is in Concord, Massachusetts. And Doug, she asks, how do high-performance, high-engagement organizations empower team members to ask challenging questions that probe the status quo and vision the future? OK, great, great, Ellen. Uh, super question. Uh, you know, and, and I think that that's, we see that all the time. Uh, you know, that, that's where this idea of culture, that's why I, I really put uh, this notion of building trust as one of the absolute critical things that's important for organizations. So if we build a climate of openness, if we build a, a, uh, that, that sense of emotional safety that I talked about, uh, people are going to then feel free to raise their hand and ask the kind of difficult questions that sometimes need to be positioned to our top management teams. Uh, and so that, you know, it's a two-way street. Uh, you know, we often hear management teams saying, how come people aren't being more, you know, uh, aggressive in terms of providing us input or, to, you know, take, rolling up their sleeves to dive in? Sometimes that's learned behavior. And so, uh, you know, they, they, you know, we don't want to have a, uh, you know, shoot the messenger type of uh, climate inside the organization. So we need to be clear uh, also, though, um, I, I, I've seen too many times top management teams inviting questions, but they don't really want to hear the answer. So that, you have to get really clear on what 
it is you really want input on. What's on the table and what's not on the table. So if you don't really need input as to the strategy, but you need input as to the approach of how we're going to execute the strategy, uh, those are two real different things, you know. So, so be clear about the kind of help you want uh, and, and then follow through on it. And so uh, that means clarity, then listen, then act, then, you know, by your deeds, trust will get built. And then more and more people will say, okay, you know, they asked for my help, I provided it, and they paid attention to me. That doesn't mean they'll always do what you suggest be done, but they'll, but trust will be built that they're going to be listening and they're going to uh, pay attention. And so I think that building that climate of trust is absolutely key. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Li Ping Lim, SF15, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. For a long-established organization with demography cut across all generations with different expectations, how do you rejuvenate the sense of purpose? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, uh, Li Ping, the, the, uh, the, yeah, I think in today's organizations, it's absolutely critical for us to have this authentic self, sense of self, that we want the input that's provided, that we want to build inclusive organizations that, uh, that allow for, in fact, demand uh, many voices to be heard. So uh, let me give you a very real example. I just spent uh, a, quite a good amount of time with uh, RBC Financial Group, the Royal Bank of Canada, helping them to do exactly this, to build what they called uh, uh, the, uh, their collective ambition, which stemmed from a Harvard Business Review article that I wrote about linking purpose and performance and principles. And so, uh, you know, part of this uh, is is that you don't go there without strong, real C-suite commitment. So the first thing you need to do is get clear with the CEO and the top management team. Uh, do they want this input? Uh, do they want the idea uh, that they're going to open this up for uh, you know dialogue with the multiple of generations that exist inside companies? So with RBC, for example, what we did is we held a whole series of focus groups cut by demography, cut by, you know, uh, by age, by region, by hierarchy in the organization. But we also ran a, a 48-hour uh, values jam that was done globally. Uh, so we used social media that really was, you know, the language that, that the millennials and Gen Zs uh, like to, to, uh, to use. And, and the response was phenomenal. They thought they'd get, you know, maybe two, three, four hundred threads that would come in. They wound up with 17,000 threads. Uh, people were just so energized that, that they were, you know, that people were asking uh, for their input. And so, so I think, you know, we've got to, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll assume that part of what was behind your question of the multiple generations is is for people who maybe have been there a long time already uh, and parts of what they hold dear, we want to value the heritage that has made your organization great. And the RBC example did that perfectly well. I mean, there were so many things about an organization that makes it great that we don't want to just uh, throw that out when we're talking about big change. Yet at the same time, great organizations are those that constantly kind of revitalize themselves. And so you want to ask the questions of saying, look, okay, these are the elements that have made us great up to now. What are the things that we need to do to be able to, while we're still honoring our past and our heritage, what can we do to make it even better for that next generation excellence that we're all striving for? And, and you use any means possible. So, so we used age old, you know, surveys and focus groups and things like that, but we also used social media at the same time, created heat maps of the things that really, really matter, uh, talk with their client base and, and together, that's how you can build a sense of, uh, of understanding what what your purpose is all about. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. 
Uh, we have a question now um, from uh, a live entry. Uh, without being inside an organization, is it possible to know if the company has the characteristics of a game-changing organization? And conversely, what are some of the telltale signs that they are not? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And, and behind that, uh, I think, is a you know, there's a there's a lot of employer branding that's out there, uh, and a lot of uh, the communication departments within companies do a really great job of uh, of, of saying, well, we're a purpose-driven enterprise, or we uh, are a very green company, or we're very sustainable, we're very inclusive, uh, and and as I said to you before in the in the session, saying it doesn't make it so. Talk is cheap. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, there are some things that can be done, uh, you know, Glassdoor, things like, you know, things that, you know, there are some social media sites that you can look at these days to get a sense of what uh, employees that are currently working for your organization feel about the organization. And, you know, you need to filter some of these things out to make sure they're not uh, being submitted by disgrunt disgruntled employees and things like that. But um, but I think you need to get inside of an organization. You need you know to to really really understand that uh, the culture of the place. Um, you know it's it's why I spent uh, quite a bit of time during the session talking about it because uh, the authenticity of a company's culture and its climate uh, makes a huge difference between whether or not it's going to be a game changer. Now, to your other part of your question, uh, I think you can ask uh, some very legitimate questions if you're thinking about joining a company to say, well, okay, you know, you talk about being a purpose-driven enterprise. Uh, I understand and I see your purpose statement. Uh, can you share with me two or three initiatives that you have underway that really tend to uh, reinforce uh, what, uh, what you say your purpose statement is all about? Uh, what about our core values? You know, do are people actually rewarded for living their values? Uh, are people promoted against them? You know, or you know, is this the type of organization that, you know, that really rewards uh, rainmakers, uh, regardless of whether they these uh, individuals might have hit their numbers on the backs of their colleagues? So, so I think it's total fair game to be able to ask some tough questions. Uh, not in a way that's, you know, pejorative or, or insulting, but, but to say I'd like, I'd love to see some real examples of the things of how you're living your, your sense of purpose and living out your guiding principles and core values. I think that's total fair game. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions that um, address the more challenging times in organizations. Um, what is your advice on building confidence and commitment when a company is weathering challenging times, including layoff, cost reduction, um, curtailing benefits, that, that type of uh, situation? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, know, you know, my view of this uh, is that it's never more important uh, to be able to double down on your core purpose and your guiding principles and values, particularly during the tough times. It's really easy to, to kind of live those slogans when things are going great. What's very hard is to do it when you're really facing uh, uh, ch uh, true challenges. And uh, I'll, I'll give you another example of that. And I can, I can talk to these things because I've, I've, they're in the public domain because I've written articles about them. Uh, the Four Seasons, you know, the hospitality and hotel uh, group is a classic example of an organization that uh, in, in the 2008, 2000, early 2009, uh, when the global financial crisis hit, uh, if you think about Four Seasons business model, it really was, and, and to this day, to a certain extent, still is reliant upon high-end business travel where those individuals then might tack on a few days of holiday and invite their family to join them with a, you know, who could have submitted a travel voucher to, uh, to their companies for staying at the Four Seasons in 2008? So, so here's a company that for the first time in their history uh, saw red ink. And uh, I had the, the privilege of working with their founder, Isidore Sharp and their top management team to actually, you know, think about, you know, the, the, 
the recalibration of their big transformation initiative. And, uh, and Izzy Sharp, as he's uh, known, uh, you know, said, you know, we're going to double down on our core sense of purpose. Uh, we're not going to hide from it. We're not going to run from it. Um, and and he, he really did a phenomenal job of, of getting his top management team together to reinforce to people around the world uh, that built that trust. Now, now, what that meant was, you know, certain people, uh, yes, indeed, you know, lost their job. They had to do some reduction in their employees, but they knew it was going to be done in keeping with the core values of the organization. And so you had, uh, even though there was some pain that the organization went through as they were engaged in their transformation, they did it completely in, uh, consistently with what they called uh, the golden rule, that uh, treating others as, as you would like to be treated. Uh, and they built a very powerful sense of trust and goodwill to get them through those, uh, those tough times. So it can be done, uh, but my view of it is, is that is the most important time to actually double down on your core sense of, of the, the, your North Star, the guiding principles and, and, uh, and your sense of purpose. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, in building trust, do you allow people to fail? What are the rewards and consequences of failure? And do you believe that failure leads to success? Well, not always, but uh, but yeah, I mean, failure, it depends. And if you learn from the failure, I, I think, you know, most of the, you know, this, this is where we get into this purpose, performance, and principles. I think most uh, most CEOs would that that really do believe in in working on that mantra would say, sure, uh, to to really uh, be a game changing company, that means uh, you need to commit to a, a a a climate of continuous experimentation. Now it doesn't mean that we fail all over the place and we just slap ourselves on the back for doing so. It means it means we learn from those failures. We try really hard not to repeat that same failure a second time. Um, but um, but I think acknowledging the fact that if you're going to be a risk taker, you have to experiment. And any you know if you're in the pharma company, uh, over 90% of the things you experiment on are going to fail. You know, so those are there are certain companies that are just absolutely hardwired to building you know cultures of experimentation. Uh, but it's what you do with those experiments, uh, you know, and and it's how you treat those failures. If if uh, if I'm in an organization and I see somebody that took a risk uh, in the best interest of the company and and they either stub their toe or outright failed, and then that person is punished uh, either mildly or severely. Uh, I'm going to be a little hesitant to raise my hand to take a risk uh, that next time. And so, so the organization is looking, and the organization learns from the behaviors that we see and the rewards and consequences. That's why I laid out that formula for everybody. Uh, you know, the people are going to say, well, wait a minute, these are the things we're saying that we're all about, experimentation, innovation. But if we see those that do that and then don't create a perfect outcome, that they get, uh, they get uh, you know, shot, then, then, you know, then you've got an inauthentic culture. So, so we need to make sure uh, that, you know, that we can, that we would reward experimentation uh, even if that means a certain level of failure, but not in such a way that that we're just doing it without learning from it and seeing how we're going to uh, do this better next time around. Thanks. Great. Um, Alid Kamara, uh, MBA 2014, has a question. Um, how do you put in place appropriate incentives to drive high performance especially in quasi-private sector and public sector organizations where the organizational motivations to, quote, win today and, quote, unleash energy are not as acute? Yeah, no, that's, uh, these are really super questions. I, well, you know, I happen to have spent seven years of my career in the public sector in the very early days uh, in working in anti-poverty programs. So I totally understand what you're talking about. Um, uh, and, and that there are different motivations but on different organizations. Even in the private sector, you have some organizations that, uh, that have much longer 
uh, lead times, much, much longer runways in terms of the, the business model that they're committing to. Uh, and so you have to make sure that the incentives that you have are aligned against you know, your, um, your, your sense of what, what you value and what your stakeholder community values. So if it's in the public sector, uh, you know, it's it's not always money, and uh, I know that from hard experience of uh, you know, uh, but, uh, but saying you know that that you you join a public sector organization generally because you believe deeply in the purpose and principles and 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 the stated objectives of what that organization is all about. Um, you know, the, I, I did a lot of work with the U.S. Federal Reserve System, for example, years ago. And, you know, these are people who had phenomenal backgrounds that could work for any private sector financial services firm. Uh, and yet through that sense of, uh, of, of duty and stewardship, uh, they, they work for one-tenth of what they could, but because they believe in the purpose of the organization. So, so I think it's getting clear about your purpose, getting clear about uh, the objectives, getting clear about what those outcomes are, whether it's, uh, whether it's performance or outstanding uh, delivery of value to your, to your shareholder, uh, your uh, stakeholder community, even if it's a public sector organization. Uh, be clear about it. Be honest about it. Uh, understand that there are other rewards outside of economic rewards that you can be clever about. Uh, you know, who gets to go to that, uh, that meeting where you're going to present to the board? Uh, you know, who gets to, uh, to talk to uh, and work with, uh, you know, kind of next generation projects? Uh, you know, there's lots of things that we can do as leaders that, uh, that can uh, be kind of arrows in our quiver, so to speak, for the rewards packages that we can provide that go beyond just money. And so, so being a little creative about the things uh, is, is, I think, really key, but also understanding that there will be differing uh, sets of, of incentives and rewards, whether you're in the public or the private sector. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much, Professor Reddy. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, we want to thank everyone for joining us today and uh, our, our alumni and friends as well. To keep the conversation going over social media, please use the hashtag Sloaney Chat. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy us for future Sloan Alumni Online events made possible in part by the Sloan Annual Fund. As today's event comes to a close, please take a moment to complete the brief survey that will automatically pop up on your screen. Thank you again, Professor Reddy, and thank you all for joining us for MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Thank you.